I think we are living in a changed reality. And uh, if we don't reflect that reality in our work, I think it's because we are trying to shut our eyes to it. So that's what I I would say that, uh, you know, that's just my effort is to try and uh, reflect all these changes that I see around me. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to have a conversation with our guests, Amitav and Kazi, and we expect the conversation to be somewhat organic and uh, between all three of us and on occasion between the guests. Um, To begin with, I want to introduce the idea that um, both of them, as writers and researchers, uh, use archival material extensively in their writing. And as a librarian, that stands out to me particularly. And I would like to ask them both about how necessary the archives are, digital and print, in informing their respective research and writings. Shall I go first? Yes, please. Well, first of all, uh, thank you for having me. It's really such a pleasure to be here. Um, And thanks for your question, uh, which is a very interesting question uh, to me. Because yes, uh, my work, uh, almost all my work in one way or the other engages with uh, uh, with archives of various kinds. And I've really dealt with many, many different kinds of archives. And it's always made, uh, you know, it, it always engages me very much. I love being in libraries, though nowadays one doesn't have to be in a library, <laughs> you know, anymore. And that's kind of a sad thing, I think, because libraries are such wonderful places to be. That's right. And actually, this studio is in what used to be a library uh, and it's still called the building is still called Sinclair Library on our campus. So I really appreciate your your comments about that. And uh, libraries do, are changing in the same way that the information that you receive or that we store in there. Um, and Kazi, what is your um, take mm. on this? Thank issue? you, Monica. I thought that would be a natural question coming from you as a librarian. Um, but you know that I'm an architect and also I write. And I can't, I have been, I have had difficulties saying that I'm a writer, but I've written. I'm an architectural historian, an architectural critique. And I think the writing has come to me out of a certain kind of necessity to make architecture more clear for me. I need, an architect need not be a writer. But for an architect to be an architect and a writer both at the same time, it's not an easy thing because they demand different things from you. Uh, but in terms of my writing, yes, of course, you know, I've used the library as well as the archive. But I think I see it in the eyes of an architect. So to me, the city is an archive. You know, So wherever I am, I'm archiving little things. Uh, unnecessary things, uh, of course, the you know the significant things, the things that stand out, and they are all part of a kind of mental uh, notebook. So that has been a part of my way of you know both informing my being an architect and a writer. And what Amita was saying that you know you use the archive less these days because many of the books are online. Uh, while I was doing the Great Padma book, and that was during the time of the pandemic, and you know, you're not going anywhere, you're not traveling from one city to another. But I found that all the books that I needed to have access to are available online. You know, some of the very sort of rare ones, and I'm just amazed. There was, I think, there was never one occasion that where I could not find the book. I'm really pleased to hear that because actually a lot of faculty have uh, come up to me in recent months and uh, have expressed such gratitude for the effort that the libraries made to provide access to the content um, during that time when people couldn't leave their homes and travel to places. So I'm really pleased to hear you say the same thing. Um, the other question I have is really related to the, the fact that, um, and it's, connected to reading more than writing, and that is that people globally read significantly less nowadays 
And according to my colleague, Ashok Das, uh, this has been proven statistically. So opting instead to consume information from the intensely fraught and confounding space of social media. How then might the art of written storytelling need to be adapted or evolved to expand its reach and stay relevant? And now you can speak, Amita, from your writing and uh, Kazi, if you would address that in terms of your work as an architect. Well, that's a very good question. Uh, I don't know if people are necessarily reading less because certainly our book sales have risen, mm. you know, and they keep rising. So, uh, you know, I'm just not sure what the statistics actually show. But uh, it is certainly true, I think, that uh, younger people uh, don't read in the ways that, say, my generation read, you know, long books over long periods of time or when you just uh, shut yourself away with a book and just entered that world, it became a sort of deep immersion uh, process and so on. Uh, I just don't think that, that that happens so much today. And, um, you know, my books are exactly that, <laughs> you know, that kind of book, uh, you know, long with a deep sort of immersive element to them. Uh, I feel fortunate that, you know, uh, I have a certain demographic uh, who who can still read those books, and they do read those books. Uh, but, uh, you know, in, in the future, whether younger readers will have the skills uh, that are necessary for reading a long book like, uh, uh, let's say, Moby Dick, mm -hmm. I don't know if that will really, uh, if, if, if that will go on anymore, really. And do you feel like sometimes it, people may not have that um, extensive span of time that they spend reading? but it's more sort of in bits and pieces where you know there's a lot of interruptions with the technology that people are engaging with and uh, different forms of communication that perhaps we didn't have those distractions in the time period that you know now you and I have probably experienced where you could lock yourself up in a <laughs> place and read for the pleasure of reading and for going through that story. Uh, uh, you, uh, um, yes, you're absolutely right. I think, uh, you know, these new technologies, uh, they just disrupt your attention all the time. I mean, we know that with, uh, you know, younger children, they're showing signs of all these new disorders, uh, which, you know, one had never heard of before, you know. So yes, I, I think people are becoming less and less capable of just paying attention for, for long periods of time. But what you're saying, I think, in relation to that is that uh, there's still an interest at a certain level of readership. And um, certainly your work has a kind of readership that seems to not be uh, afraid of uh, committing to, to reading. You know, there are huge differences internationally. I mean, Good if you, uh, you know, if you go to, a, let's say, a literary festival in the United States, uh, usually, uh, I would say I've been to literary festivals where the audience is like, I would say almost 90% uh, women. Uh, and I would say 90% uh, of them are uh, middle-aged or older. It's, uh, you know, then there may be, uh, you know, 10% men, but you rarely see a young uh, young man at uh, festivals in America. You know, that's uh, that's become very unusual now. The only place where it's different, uh, I think, is uh, like places that have large Spanish-speaking populations. For some mm. reason, that's uh, quite different. So if you go to the Miami Festival, it's really striking how many, um, how, you know, that's one place where a lot of young men turn out. So maybe within Spanish-speaking populations, they've really preserved a strong sense of uh, uh, of readership. Uh, in India, it's quite different, I would say. Uh, in India, uh, I think readership is expanding very fast. And uh, the book industry has been uh, expanding exponentially. When you go to Indian festivals, uh, they're f crowded with young people. So there are these big differences internationally. And I think we may be in a transitional moment and we really don't know where things yeah. are heading. 
because I love books, books of all kind. I like the design of books and I like the smell of books, you know, to hold a book, to go through it, you know, the texture on the cover, on the pages. So, you know, I love books. So I go out to and I, I frequent uh, old bookstores you know, uh, quite a bit. So I, we, I have a bookstore in Philadelphia that I go to and typically I, I know the owner very well and I'm asking that, you know, if things are going well, just to get a sense of, you know, books are selling. He says it's great, it's going well and he has, he has a big bookstore uh, in Philadelphia and he's been around for over 20 years now. So that's good news. But at the same time, um, the new technology, the new elements in social media is kind of, you know, transforming our ways of reading things, as you say, you know, we're getting information or how we um, invest ourselves in reading. So reading books is a kind of investment, you know, and uh, whether we're willing to do that and whether young people are willing to do that, you know, those are questions. And perhaps we can predict a little bit, but we're not quite sure where things will go. I think both of you raised really important things that I kind of want to reflect on a little bit more. And that was the differences globally in audiences where they're somewhat gendered to some degree, depending on the location. And it's not restricted to any particular country or place, but that you've noticed some variations in those audiences. And that's kind of interesting to me. Um, I also wonder about the communities that are represented in those areas. The other thing I wanted to talk a little bit about, and if you could expand, you both live in multiple places and spend uh, time doing work and talks and teaching in, uh, as you said, Amitabha, earlier, you've done these talks at how many universities just in the past week? At least two. Kazi, you are both in Dhaka and here, uh, Amitav, you're in New York and Brooklyn and elsewhere. So um, you have a really good sense of the differences of what you see and observe, as opposed to somebody who may only see their own community. And so I think it's really nice that you're able to share with us uh, mm -hmm. some of your interactions with people and, and perspectives. So. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next thing I want to actually talk about is the importance of the humanities. And Kazi, I'm going to include architecture, even though it's not really considered a part of the humanities, but I know that you practice architecture. There's always been a problem with architecture. How I to see. Place it, but please go on. But your practice definitely incorporates, I think, as, a, as you said, a historian and a writer, um, the humanities. And so uh, the importance of the humanities and storytelling of narratives of literature, fiction, and the architectural um, projects in which you engage um, does address the climate crisis, right? And I think you both address climate crisis somewhat differently. And I hope you can talk to that difference a little bit. Um, and Ghazi, I'd like you to talk a little bit first about the, how climate uh, change has impacted or how it complicates your view of what you do. Mm -hmm. And because generally I think the perception um, associates work of climate change with STEM fields. And uh, what I'm hoping is with our conversation today, <clears throat> we can give some ideas on altering that perception to include the humanities. Well, you know, if I got your question correctly, um, you know, architecture is deeply implicated in the whole affair of climate change in many ways. Uh, first of all, you know, if I'm correct in saying the number, 38% of the carbon emission comes from mm. what we do with buildings, cities, installations, infrastructure, roads, and all that. 38%, that's a huge amount. Um, so architects are on the defensive here, on the docks actually, in terms of their contribution to this whole business. But architecture at the same time is so fundamental to human beings. You know, I mean, uh, architecture in its most essential sense, habitats and what have you. I don't mean the sort of flamboyant buildings and all that. 
So I, I think we have to participate, um, not in, only in the discourse, but also in the so-called solution, if you like, to the crisis and climate change. And, um, and I think, I, you, know, you know, that I taught at UH from 2001 to 2014, and here climate change was really a major topic. And I think I kind of, and I have to admit this, I kind of entered the climate change scenario in Hawaii. And I think sometimes it was not named as climate change. It was sort of the envi environmental crisis mm -hmm. and how Hawaii, the island here, the sort of the beauty of the island, how this has been slowly eroded by commercialism or, you know, um, tourism, uh, tourism or extra and building. Way. And I think they were all related. Mm -hmm. And I was getting into that conversation. So that's one thing. So one, I'm not saying one, uh, you know, could have avoided it. N not that one just entered that discussion right away in these schools of architecture. And now across all schools, you know, it's a major discussion, you know, climate change in one way or another. But so I, I haven't, as I said, I've entered this sort of, you know, topic, uh, looking at changes in our environment, changes in our landscape. And, and therefore changes in the climate. And I, by climate, I don't mean the planetary climate, the climate that's just around us, the environing climate. Mm. So that has been my interest and sometimes in a very conceptual way. And I'm more interested in the conceptual understanding of climate and architecture. So not climate change, climate and architecture. And I felt that climate itself was not addressed uh, conceptually by many people, including architects. Although architects work with climate, it's very fundamental to it. You know, how building sits in a place, you know, how the weather is, uh, the whole business of you know, handling weathering. And I just give a quick example. In the 1920s, modern architecture erupted on the scenario as this sort of idea of this autonomous thing, a thing by itself, the white cubic thing standing on the landscape, and it could ward off weathering. You know, the, the most basic thing about climate, if you like, that it impinges on you, on our body, and we weather on buildings, it weathers, and the building is such that it will just resist and rise above those things. Obviously, that did not work. Uh, so architects have always been a kind of, you know, um, uh, you know, paradoxical situation with climate since that time, but now it has been embraced. Okay, so we have to deal with this thing, you know, we are, you know, we are, there are not two things. Here is climate and here is a building, you know, they're intertwined. So really the, the connection between the environment right. and construction in a way, yes. um, at, at both a basic level and a much more developed level. And by that I mean um, where cities are congested with tall buildings in what looks like concrete jungle. And slightly related to that, I also wanted to bring up, uh, Hawaii is a place that has, um, you know, all the military represented here. And there's a lot of prime space on the islands that is occupied by those armed forces um, uh, and their um, bases. So, you know, there's impact both uh, in the general environment and then these other more exclusive environments. And um, Amitav, I want to turn it over to you now to perhaps respond to some of the things that Kazi said and also to talk about um, the kind of differences in, um, in what impacts the climate in any particular place where you have these competing sort of um, structures that some of which is part of like a development program of the city, perhaps, and some of it is handled by somebody at the Pentagon, perhaps. Well, <clears throat> let me say first, uh, first of all, that, you know, I completely agree with uh, Kazi that uh, it's not just climate change, you know, uh, as Margaret Atwood famously said, it's not just climate change, it's everything change. Mm -hmm. And that's really what we're seeing. We're seeing a multidimensional planetary crisis, you know. Uh, and we have to think about it in that way. And I think architecture is actually in the forefront of this. And a lot of architects uh, constantly write to me about my books and want me to participate in various uh, biennales and so on. And I've, I've 
in architecture biennale in venice i wrote a forward for one of their books i think it was the danish pavilion or something mm. so they are certainly engaging but i have to say that i think i i don't see what the product of that engagement is because every time you look around in fact the new buildings that are going up seem to me to be so completely unsuited to the world ahead you know all of them are completely dependent on fossil fuels that is energy from fossil fuels uh, that seems to be going on more and more and more uh you know huge sort of sheets of glass which actually raise the temperature inside uh, inside the buildings uh, i mean if you go really to especially to these uh, cities like um, let's say qatar or, or you know dubai or whatever you just see these giant uh, buildings built in absolutely the wrong place you know but they're completely dependent on fossil fuels but you see that actually in so many other places as well for example let's say phoenix arizona you know where the temperatures are really actually not livable i mean just imagine if they have a, a even a minor failure of um, of uh, the electricity grid you know and that's very very possible because we saw that in texas uh, huntsville alabama for example uh, had a uh, had a power failure that lasted one, uh, one week you know suppose something happens like that in phoenix arizona uh, and the strange thing is that the people who are moving there are mainly older people uh That's you know yes, who are going to find it retirement communities yeah, and they're going to find it very hard to uh, to continue but at the same time i must say that there has been some very interesting work done on uh, sustainable architecture i saw a wonderful example of the uh, example of that in dhaka uh, it, it's included in kazi's book you know of uh, these uh, uh, these houses that can actually uh, float and uh, you know arise above floods and so on so there is a lot of innovative work happening as well but the but the buildings that you were referring to say in places like the middle east and which are actually copies of mm. an idea of uh, the city mm. or or an ensemble of tall buildings in the manhattan which then yeah. gets repeated perhaps a little bit in mumbai and other places or even shanghai i say it's a terrible conjunction of few things uh you know one is steel construction exactly uh, two is the elevator if there was no elevator you would not think of doing all no, these things simple as that and air conditioning that's we true. don't talk about it that much i think air conditioning changed everything that's right, right. and we see it here in hawaii all that's the right. time too Absolutely. when you can be in an environment that would be much more comfortable with the trade winds perhaps uh right wasn't there a uh, regulation in hawaii until sometime late 60s yeah. that all government buildings will be non air conditioned mm-hmm. i think the computer came in and changed that yeah. a bit uh but i think those three three things together and added to that something totally uh, something else which is you know the so human desire to present and build mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. sort of you know represent things Mm-hmm. uh and and then you have all the cities that mm-hmm. amitabh is talking about and and you know not not to digress but i i shall is to talk about how the military bases are mm-hmm. not necessarily tall large buildings but they occupy True. an expanse of area that is significant right? right so talking about that and i we can go back to that we don't need to emphasize that much more and i wanted to move a little bit also kazi to the question i have uh, regarding your work on the padma because you really focused on water and we all know water is a huge issue for us all over the world uh, <clears throat> our water groundwater has been contaminated on the naval base on red hill um you know we we have groundwater that is extraordinarily uh, pure and um clear and we're so lucky to have that but now that's not the case um but to talk about the river systems you both written about you know the delta areas in bangladesh and bengal and um how those kind of inspire and influence or create problems or mm-hmm. other kinds of issues that perhaps we haven't all thought about 
and if you wouldn't mind enlightening us in that direction. I think this is for you. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yes. oh, you've been. Uh, We're all water people. We're all from the right. same part of India. <laughs> Monica, before uh, going into this question, you know something you mentioned before about uh, precious landscapes that have been tampered with, not by tall buildings, but the other kinds of installations that need not be vertical. Uh, well, just think of sprawl. Mm -hmm. of many yes. cities, it need not be sprawl, but because we can, because we have the automobile or the train, the other thing that has uh, uh, changed modern lifestyle is the train, actually. I mean, whether, you know, of course, there are good things about it, but, but now that you can uh, live in one part and travel to another part and live in a sprawled neighborhood. So whether sprawl should be contained or curtled, you know, and not just the tall buildings. That's another important question in terms of, say, climate change or environmental change. You know, it brings us to the question of footprints. Mm -hmm. So I, I just wanted to mention that, you know, there are many culprits here of one sort or another. Mm -hmm. But uh, Amitav, you wanted to say something? I, I was going to say that I find myself really uh, very interested in this uh, concept of the 15-minute city. Mm -hmm where everything is uh, literally within reach because I live in a city like that, which right. is Brooklyn, right. uh, you know, and uh, really I hardly ever have to have to go anywhere. And if I do, I, I go in the subway. Um, but, uh, you know, it is very striking that just as with climate denial, uh, the right wing have taken up this idea of the 15 minute city and have started attacking it mm -hmm. uh, as an attack upon their liberties. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, to drive as, as right. far as they want. That's right. You know, it's uh, it's in that way that we just seem to be caught in these tentacles, mm -hmm. you know, because once you do create these sprawling uh, urban uh, me megalopolises, mm -hmm. uh, like, for example, Los Angeles, it's very hard to turn the clock back. Mm -hmm. And the impact on the environment, of course. And, it's know, catastrophic. LA's, yeah. the, the issue with water and... Um, the resources. Maybe the people have degraded. issue about the 15 minute city because it's a French idea. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that could be the case. Right. But again, I would say that, uh, you know, uh, it's France, even though it's come up with this idea. Uh, every time I go into the French countryside now, you know, once upon a time, the villages, small villages, used to have a grocer, they used to have, uh, you know, a butcher, I mean, you know, little shops. Now, if you go to French uh, French uh, towns, even small ones, uh, they don't have that anymore. So you have to travel to you have a to get into your car mm -hmm. and drive to a what they call a hyper marché mm -hmm. uh, to buy your uh, to buy your stuff. Uh, in Italy, it's still not like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, this whole sprawl thing is a direct result of the EU's uh, uh, way of, ways of planning, mm -hmm. you know. But, but what is sort of, you know, important about the idea of the 15-minute city, which had, been, which had been tried out in other ways in uh, urbanism and architecture, is the whole idea of walkability, mm. you know, walkable cities, you know, and with mm. walkability comes encounters. And whole kind of experiences that driving in a car will get you other kinds of experiences, but these encounters don't happen. That you could just walk and yeah. pause and stop and look and look left and right. Uh, I think those are even something to consider for uh, our possibly new cities. So thank you, Kazi, for that comment about encounters and that interaction with people, right? And earlier we were talking about how we engage with books and learning. And um, that's a more exclusive, right? Uh, but, but those chance encounters, the conversations that we have with people uh, in, in walking and taking that kind of mode of transportation, if you will, um, is a completely different experience. And Amitav, earlier you had talked about the idea of a 15-minute city, but I'm wanting to go back to that idea, which is that isn't a 15-minute city include a pedestrian activity and it not necessarily the efficiency of getting to places, which would require more automated transportation? See, uh, I mean, what we are assuming here 
is that people want encounters. And certainly I want encounters. And I think it's generally the case that uh, in South Asia and Asia in particular, people do want encounters. And that's really true also of uh, uh, European cities, I think. But uh, in America, I don't know that if people necessarily want encounters, because it could be an encounter with someone with a gun. Uh, you know, and I think people feel safer in their cars now. Uh, it's so there again, you have this kind of dystopian uh, sort of knot, you know, which keeps you tied up, uh, tied into these various kinds of uh, you know, really dystopic constraints. But but I think deep down you would still want, if not encounters, be with people in one form or another, um, whether in festivals, you know, even in during pandemic, when the restaurants opened up and came out on the street, you know, and one time I was in Philadelphia and it seemed Amazing. like a summer festival. Yeah. It never happened in that city. So that's one uh Thing that I can think of. The other in South Asia, on the other hand, the middle class and the upper mm. middle class are increasingly becoming isolated in their so-called flats and apartments that they're not coming out. And their air condition, heavy curtains. So they move from their sort of hermetically sealed mm. spaces into their hermetically sealed cars and go to their hermetically sealed offices. And I see that increasingly. Um, and not everybody is interested to go out on the street because the streets in South Asia are not safe for other reasons. That's right. <laughs> it's polluted. <laughs> yes. And there are all kinds of people out there that I don't want to deal with. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, it kind of goes both ways then. Yeah, I think you're the, both making really good points. And, um, you know, I've heard so many stories about New York City where, you know, something horrible is happening on the street and people are just walking on by, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then on the other hand, uh, you know, it's it's the... How do we engage people to be involved and responsible? And I think part of that is very much tied to how connected you are to your community. And sometimes your community isn't an entire city. It might just be your neighborhood, which mm -hmm. in my case, a lot of times I walk a lot and um, in my neighborhood. And so I meet people, I have encounters, I have memories that... I can't get if I just go to another neighborhood in a short period of time. It's really that lived experience that then develops those connections. So I think those were really important points. Uh, you know, it's true that uh, uh, you see those stories about uh, something terrible happening on the streets of New York and people walking by. But uh, that certainly is not my experience, I must say. I mean, in general, when you see something like that, um, I would say in Brooklyn, uh, people do stop or they, call, you know, they'll just ask the police to come or whatever. Mm -hmm. They may not personally want to get involved. But uh, but uh, <clears throat> again, we are talking about um, a city like New York or a city like Philadelphia. But uh, in cities where there is urban sprawl, I mean, just these last few days, there have been so many stories of some uh, someone acts, you know, going to the wrong address and knocking and getting shot. Right. You know, and that that's a very American story. That's the reality of a lot of the people's experiences in the U.S. And, and it seems like um, it doesn't seem to end. And uh, yeah. the, the laws and the legislation for gun control is um, fraught and a two-sided affair that um, unfortunately leaves us to have to experience this repeatedly, you can't really get numb from it. It's still horrific whenever it happens. And of course, people of color and the poor are disproportionately impacted by those conditions. I'm slightly going to shift a little bit in our direction here. Amitav, you're a single author. And you've talked about how you like to work, you know, and do your work somewhat in independently, but an acknowledgement of any of your books will show that you actually discuss and uh, have <clears throat> opinions from a lot of people to give you feedback as you develop your, your writing. And Kazi, you are much more collaborative, I think, like for the example, The Great Padma has so many contributors. I lost count at some point, 
but Amitav has written the introduction to the book and he worked with lots of different people to give different perspectives on things. And so I want you to talk about um, the advantages and disadvantages, perhaps, or drawbacks of your practice and what you see for yourselves in future works. Well, yes, you know, the uh, the work of writing a novel, for example, is very individualistic. You know, you, you, you sit in a room and write, a, and write away and then, you know, and actually it's not just the novelist who's uh, very individualistic, even the reader, the act of reading is a very individual thing or has become because we all read in our heads now, which is something that didn't happen until the late 18th century. People always read collectively, you know, mm -hmm. you always read out. So uh, you would say that there was a, an aspect of oral tradition yeah. in the sharing of stories and narratives. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, mm -hmm. it was very common, uh, you know, for families to sit around the fire and read, uh, mm -hmm. and someone reads out a book, which absolutely doesn't happen anymore. Uh, it's very rare. But, uh, you know, I've become more and more interested in working actually with um, collaboratively. So I've done uh, two projects where I've worked with, uh, with collaborators. And that's been really wonderful. I've collaborated with the Pakistani uh, singer Ali Sethi, uh, who last year had the most Googled song anywhere in the world. Uh, and I've worked with uh, Salman Tour, the artist. Uh, and uh, these were very rewarding experiences for me. If it were possible for me to change uh, to change direction at this late age in my life, uh, I think I would like to start working in the theatre. And there's a long Bengali tradition of theatre and folk theatre, actually. Yes, so, absolutely. Um, yes. And and that folk theatre is inspired by sort of ordinary lives and people, mm. and not necessarily. Yeah. Um, you know, the aristocracy or That's the right. highly landed uh, <laughs> aristocrats, right? Um, Nazi? Well, you know, I have to bring up again the point that I'm also an architect. Um, and, yes. and both of, and both as a writer, Amitav is the, the well-known writer and I write and I'm also an architect. So, but both involves a kind of self-reflective, interiorized mode of production, if you like, whether it's a book or a design or a, something else along that line. Um, and collaboration has been attempted in architecture, in design, but not always very successfully, you know. I, and many points, uh, I mean, people work together, but they take on the kind of the, the mantle of this sort of artist and, and in art it's very difficult to collaborate but people do try many interesting things that have come up so it's a kind of a, a very tricky thing to work that out and depending on your personality and all that so I have tried I mean if you like collaborative the book I wouldn't call it collaborative you know I have you know so choreographed the book if you like you know I edited the book have invited people to write and Amitav mentioned in his uh, introduction that the river Padma has many avatars. Mm -hmm. And to bring that to the forefront, you know, you really have to go out and, you know, beyond your disciplines, you know, it has to just spill out. And which is perhaps what I did. I, and I'm not shy about doing that. You know, I would go right, bring people in and give the many voices that a river as the Padma requires. So I've done that in many of my projects. But I must say with writing, I have lost a friend or two in the act of collaboration <laughs> because I think, I think the demands and pace of each other often did not work. So I'm also careful that way. So it's a little bit of a drawback, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so we're kind of getting to a little bit towards the end of our conversation. And my question is really about... Um, in your work, do you consider yourself to be in some way bearing witness to what you see and um, where you're um, where you're at? And um, do you see that work as being sort of a direct form of action in efforts to influence people and perhaps <clears throat> inform and remedy the damage of what? Amitav, you've written about is the Anthropocene. 
and how so? Well, I would certainly say that uh, uh, I try to reflect, uh, how shall I say, everything change, <laughs> you know, rather than just climate change. Mm -hmm. Because um, I think we are living in a changed reality. And uh, if we don't reflect that reality in our work, I think it's because we are trying to shut our eyes to it. So that's what I, I would say that, uh, you know, that's just my effort is to try and uh, reflect all these changes that I see around me. Whether I certainly don't think of uh, my my work being a kind of direct uh, intervention uh, in any sense, but uh, I, a lot of people tell me that you know uh, they've been inspired to do this and that uh, by reading my uh, my books, and a lot of activist groups, uh, uh, you know, uh, really regard my work as very fundamental to what they do, and they're constantly asking me to join them in this and that, which I very gladly do. So, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a complicated thing. It is a complicated thing <laughs> because there are different kinds of engagement with the topic that you are mentioning, climate change or environmental changes, which is what I would like to prefer. Uh, by different kinds of engagement, meaning, you know, um, you could you could write about it in a way that documents or archives the phenomenon that's happening in front of you. But that's one way of doing that, which is what journalists do, perhaps, you know. And then, as an architect, you know, we we tend to look at the future. We tend to critique things that are around you, and then you're offering an alternative vision. Whether it works to some degree or not, that's a different thing. But we are constantly doing that. So uh, what I do, combining the two, is you know what I've been calling design activism. It's not just designing for a client, for a site, but uh, taking up design uh, on our own, doing research on a topic on our own, and then presenting it to the public platform, whether it's in a newspaper or an exhibition, that this is what it can be as one of the many possible solutions to a certain sort of environmental issue. Uh, you know that besides uh, academic writing or doing good things like the great Padma book, you know, I, I also write in newspapers, you know, and which is a different kind of writing, mm -hmm. you know, the language and all that, very straightforward. And uh, so I was invited to write by the editor of Dhaka's important English daily, The Daily Star. And initially I was writing in what you note as bearing witness as a journalistic kind of a thing. And I thought, you know, I, I, what I, uh, why sh I should be doing that. You know, the journalist who can just pinpoint one in Dhaka, you can just, every day you can list 10 things that are going wrong, right? And I just don't want to commit on doing the same thing. So what I thought that as an architect, I should be writing and saying, what else can be done? What are the alternatives? And also as an architect, I can draw. So with my um, journalistic pieces, I also added Im images, you know, like the future. And some of the things I think that's happening is this kind of authoritarian uh, governance that's happening in a lot of places globally, and particularly in, in developed countries. So um, how is that in any way impacting some of the work that you are um, engaged in? Um, I feel like that is something we really don't talk about is the external forces rather than just the environment, but these kind of government things that, um, you know, come under the guise of unshackling colonial encumbrances, but, and they, they get the support of the popular vote, and, um, but really the outcome <clears throat> is that it causes a lot of um, problems in the environment, uh, both natural and cultural. And so in your experiences, what are some of the positive work that's being done in South Asia and globally? And what hope does it bring for us now and in the future? <laughs> and Amitabh, I'm going to put you a little bit on the spot because I know we've talked earlier about the impact indigenous people and communities have had on 
uh, movements and social movements and social justice movements regarding both their communities and the environment. And if you would um, talk to us a little bit about those ideas and um, how they have influenced perhaps you in some way. Uh, well, I think uh, uh, indigenous thought uh, today uh, is uh, just very important for us to uh, confront this, uh, this crisis that we are in. And actually, there are, there, the only really bright spots that one can see are indigenous-led uh, uh, movements that have resisted, uh, let's say, fossil fuel companies and also other kinds of interventions, you know, for example, the whole uh, Mauna Kea thing uh, that's happening here uh, in Hawaii. So I think that's one of the few points of light, really, I would say, uh, uh, in an otherwise very, very dark horizon. And that horizon is darkening day by day. And battles can be won, I think, if you go with the right spirit and attitude and respect for the land, I think is, to me, that's what Mauna yeah. Kea is, the, the people Absolutely. standing up and um, Absolutely. defending mm. their, their knowledge systems, their history, their stories. Mm. Um, Azir? Um, but yeah, you know, there was a... Uh, first part to your question about working with uh, governmental agencies. But I think more than the governments or the sort of, you know, as you mentioned, autocratic government, you worry not about the governments, you worry about the new moneyed class mm. who carry more clout than ever before than I've seen, I, I can say with some authority about Dhaka. Uh, the devastation that has happened in and around Dhaka city, the mindless landfilling of wetlands, mm -hmm. floodplains, the scale of the operation is mind-boggling. We did a little study, the amount of landfilling that has happened uh, in Dhaka in, say, in the last 15 years, that is uh, good enough to fill up all of Back Bay in Boston and beyond into the waters, you know. So you don't see that, but it's happening all around you in a surreptitious way, day and night. Mm -hmm. And they carry more clout than the government. Mm -hmm. So we worry more about them than the government. You know? yeah, and the and, impact and the influence and, of one over uh, the other. Yes. And then the uh, the decisions and policies that come out of that. Right. Um, and, but and, you, what you're saying, I think, is that these things are happening simultaneously and are somewhat interconnected right. to take us to this place that doesn't look good. And also they are uh, then positioning themselves in the imagination and the desires of the middle class, this is what I want. Mm -hmm. And so not only were then fighting the moneyed class, fighting meaning, you know, you are, you know, uh, showing, debating, or you're never in a discourse with them, you know, it's always something else. And But you're also kind of working with this, you know, the whole anonymous clientele, if you like, who wants that which is presented to them from that class, the developers, if you like. So it's a very curious conjunction of forces that are happening beyond your um, vision, if you like. The government, of course, you know that they're doing this thing, then you can raise an uproar or write about it or what have you, you know, yeah. in most cases. Resist in a way that right. Um, right. you are in a position to do. And lastly, I just want to sort of throw out this question. I know that both of you are working on researching and or writing other projects. So um, would you be willing to give us some teasers? about what we can expect and look forward to in the future? Um, I, uh, I, I really always feel that it's very bad luck to talk about something you haven't finished. So I see, so I'll you're a little superstitious, are you? I'm extremely oh, superstitious. Okay, well, that's good to know. I think you've, uh, you've revealed something about yourself that I wasn't aware of before. <laughs> so, okay, but um, we'll... Keep our eyes peeled for possibilities. Sure. Well, you know, uh, after returning to Dhaka in 2015, I've increasingly become an architect all over again. There's a lot of, you know, both sort of theoretical projects and even professional projects. Few things are getting built. 
and perhaps on the next occasion I can share that with you. Uh, but you know, I think writing is something that I do. Um, uh, so my next book project, which would be in the scale of the Great Padma, but about an architect, uh, Mazharul Islam, um, mm. who was one of the leading sort of architects in Bangladesh and South Asia in the 60s. The same sort of, you know, was contemporary. Was he a mentor of yours? He or? was, he was, you know, to Doshi and Korea, but nothing much has been written about him. Uh, so not only sort of he was the sort of uh, the uh, the proponent of modern architecture and a sort of modernist ideology, but he was a hardcore Marxist. Uh, he belonged to a political party, and I, I I don't see too many architects of that kind. You know, the double commitment to the ideology of modern architecture and the political commitment to socialism. Well, there's that great Brazilian architect. Right, Oscar Niemeyer. Yeah. Right, and I think uh, similarly, you know, because, you know, uh, they believed in the socialist utopia that modern architecture in the 20s uh, came from, you know, or subscribed, you know. I think Mazar Islam stayed on with that. And at the same time, his uh, deep influence from Rabindranath Tagore. So to kind of organize all that there, Tagore, Marxism and modern architecture. So working on that right now. And then just in closing, you know, you are both here for the Center for South Asian Studies annual spring symposium. And um, one of the things I've always felt really strongly about is when we invite visitors and guests to Hawaii. What have they engaged in with this place that they will take with them and remember and hopefully return to someday? Well, it's a very interesting visual landscape. And, uh, uh, you know, I think it, it stays with one, you know, but I've just been here so for just a few days, a couple of days. So uh, I still have to think about that. <laughs> Thank you, that's fair. <laughs> Monica, you know that I lived in a number of cities, often simultaneously I would be and traveling. And then you lived in Hawaii as I well. I lived in Hawaii. Teaching at the university. That's right, so for 14 years. That's probably years. not a very fair question. Right, so to me it's kind of homecoming. I see. That was really nice to hear. One of the things which I'm very struck by is, uh, you know, I, I, I love la languages, dialects, and various uh, forms of language. I've been very struck by how uh, Hawaiian English seems to be so inflected uh, by Asia. Uh, you know, it often sounds like Singaporean English. Well, that's an interesting point that you make because my heritage is Anglo-Indian on my mother's side. And a lot of times the way people mm. speak, I think, uh, yes. re is very reminiscent of how Anglo-Indians in South Asia speak. That's right. And I think part of it is, uh, from what I've read about um, that construction of English, it really comes from a kind of pigeon that comes from sort of a translation of Hawaiian language, as well as the kind of plantation mm. language uh, among people from different cultures who came with different languages. And so that pidgin English is that way of communi communicating across the different communities who didn't necessarily arrive here with English. And as I think I mentioned to you, Amitav, Hawaiian language has a long tradition and literary history and record that was um, squashed in many ways during the last century. And there's a tremendous uh, return to that um, language learning and um, renaissance of the language, which I have witnessed just in my sure. time here. Just to add one thing to that, I think what would what the the line that joins, uh, let's say, Anglo-Indian English in India and uh, in uh, and Singaporean English and perhaps Hawaiian English is actually uh, nautical language. You know, the way that sailors spoke. That's right. And and the marine connections here yeah. are um, definitely a part of this history for centuries. That's right. And voyaging, of course, as well. Well, if there's nothing else well, you'd you. like to comment on. Well, Monica, thank you. Thank you for yes. inviting me to the event and to Honolulu. Uh, 
I love coming back. So invite me again. Yes, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. You've been such lovely guests. I want to thank you and give you a big warm mahalo to both our guests, Amitabh Kosh and Kazi Ashraf, for the stimulating and thought-provoking conversation today. Mahalo also to the many people and organizations that made their visit to Hawaii possible. The lead sponsor is the UHM Center for South Asian Studies. Co-sponsors are the Department of Asian Studies, Halekulani Hotel, Hawaii Book and Music Festival, UH Press, University of Hawaii at Manoa Library, University of Hawaii Press, and Scholars Strategy Network. Thank you. <laughs>